It is Wednesday, October 30th, 2019. This is a conclave, con uh, nest making of inside your overshare my brain, which um, I will apologize for up front. And we try to figure out uh, what uh, what's the meaning of interesting topics. And today's topic, uh, which is born from a recent conversation, actually several different conversations, is like is libertarianism. Um, and in fact, I will I, I'm just going to leap right in in a couple ways uh, because I'm going to jump over to my brain. And uh, I was just on free markets, but uh, look, here we go. Libertarianism's over here. I was just on it. And I just want to go above libertarianism for one moment, just out of a sense, a spirit of fun, to the topic of isms. And uh, one day I decided, oh, right, there's a lot of isms, so why don't I collect them? So this is, this is A through, A through C. This is absolutism through caregiverism. There's a scroll bar at the bottom. So anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism, <laughs> anarchism. There are many kinds of anarchism anti-nationalism, antinomialism, autarchism. Which one did you notice? Uh, Bobism, I don't remember putting Bobism in my brain, but it is the, the Baha'i faith, which is based on a fellow named Bob, uh, who is kind of the, the guru of, of the Baha'i. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of isms, and, and you know, as you can see, they're all connected. Cannibalism, uh, both sidesism, uh, which is part of it, which is a word in the urban dictionary. Mm -hmm. uh, Bolivarianism, Bocanonism, those of you who uh, remember Cat's Cradle uh, will remember Grand Falloons and Carasses. Absolutely. And your Carass is the, you basically your posse, even though you may not know that they're your posse, but those, they're, they're like your people, and a Grand Falloon is a false Carass. And I had that under fly, uh, parody religions, <clears throat> which include Kaibology, the Church of Kaibo, which, um, let's go up here. Uh, James Kaibo Perry basically invents Kaibology, Kaip and then also, <laughs> I almost for this call wore my Flying Spaghetti Monster t-shirt, but I decided not to, but You Could Become a Pasta Fan is another sort of uh, collection of thoughts of what to do, uh, how, to, how to face the world. So from that, I want to go back to libertarianism and kind of, kind of frame the question here uh, for this, this call's quest which is, um, there are a few things about libertarianism that I like. Um, one of them is the idea that, that you know, people's rights are people's rights and therefore the government shouldn't be intruding on things like uh, birth control and you know, rights for women over their bodies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's a few libertarian beliefs that I'm like, love that, let's go. And then there's a bunch of libertarian beliefs that cross me the wrong way. The idea that all government intervention, that the state is our enemy and that all government intervention uh, is evil. So I've created a thought here that I'd love to elaborate um, called, and I, I call it Libertarian Beliefs. <clears throat> and um, there's a couple of good Wikipedia pages. There's one on libertarianism. There's another one called Outline of Libertarianism, which seems unusual to me, but it kind of goes more in a, in a stepwise uh, path through. Here, here's, the, uh, here's the page for libertarianism itself. Um, if I go to Outline of Libertarianism, uh, we can see that it's more ordered in the sense of uh, what are the precepts uh, of libertarianism? How does it work? Which is great for our purposes here. And um, my browser's not showing it very quickly. There we go, finally. So here's the nature, the origins, libertarian policy. But it turns out that there are many different branches of libertarianism. So here, branches and schools of libertarianism. Um, and I didn't, there's left libertarianism and right libertarianism. <laughs> I'm and, sorry. And they're quite different. So what, I, so what I did under libertarianism was I created a thought with only a couple of them. I created types of libertarianism uh, and I put just a few of those, which I already had collected here, but libertarian socialism, anarcho-capitalism is kind of a form of libertarianism, believe it, heart libertarianism, believe it or not, left, right, uh, paternalism, paleo-libertarianism, et cetera, et cetera. And I think when I say libertarianism, I'm referring to right libertarianism. That's the, the, the piece that is most uh, laissez-faire capitalism, government must go, 
a government so small you can drown it in a bathtub, as uh, Grover Norquist so famously said years ago, uh, although I'm not sure he qualifies as a libertarian, but uh, partly I'm trying to figure out um, what are, how to frame critiques of libertarianism, which so uh, very often opposite thoughts, uh, I have a, a, an alternate thought uh, critiques of blank. So here's libertarianism and I use the, the lateral length, the jump thought uh, to do critiques. So here's critiques of libertarianism. And uh, for example, I have a, a thought that's reasonably well elaborated called free markets are a myth. And uh, I have a thought under that many of our markets are captured and otherwise flawed. And uh, under that should be, uh, you know, US local loop duopoly. There's actually a lot of duopoly, fake markets, overprojection of IP. Uh, somewhere in here is regulatory capture. There we go. Um, and uh, all sorts of things like that. Now, what I'd love to end up with, which is why I'm consulting sort of the, the brain posse here, is something clear. Like what, what if critiques of liberalism were such a good, clear expression of how to have a, an, an interesting conversation with a, with a deeply libertarian person that might consider, that might give them a lot of resources to go investigate what's up and that might get, might get them thinking in, in different ways. Um, that's sort of my goal is, is how can I use the brain to collect, curate and express um, a, a good solid deep position about something like, hey, you might wanna reconsider some of those libertarian beliefs. Um, because I, fi I find libertarianism pretty heartless um, and, and trying to figure out how to express that and what to say. So with that as an intro and as a framing, let me pause and see where that takes everybody and I'll stop sharing and I'll start resharing when it makes sense to. Well, I guess I have a, a question or a thought because libertarianism tends to be rather polemic as it's discussed. And I'm wondering whether if one wants to be persuasive, we have to move away from the analytical and more into the personal in some way um, in terms of less about statements, more about thoughtful questions. Um, well, how would you deal with X? Or um, I've always thought it was helpful to deal with Y in this way. I don't know what to say exactly, but I'm concerned because it has an impersonality to it that makes it out there instead of here in your heart and allows a person to be somewhat divorced from the reality. Um, I completely agree. And uh, I, I just I just went to a thought called emotion and membership Trump reason most of the time. And sorry for the word Trump in the sentence here, but I just had to use it. <laughs> um, but but I, I, you know, what I just stated was I'd like to build a logical argument <clears throat> for this. And yet you're saying something I actually believe in just as much, which is that, you know, the emotional and the connective, or also uh, my continued membership in a tribe I believe I belong to. So ostracism is a very, very powerful uh, mechanism. So, so those things do in fact uh, convince people and cause people to, to think different things. And I will also say that I'm so frustrated with the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged because they, they influenced so many people. And when people quote something John Galt did as something a normal human would do, it pisses me off just the way it pissed me off when Ronald Reagan was quoting some of his movies as if those things had happened to him in real life. It's like, no, these are fictional characters and a human author, a novelist can make a fictional character do absolutely anything, even things that are pretty unreasonable for humans to do. Never mind that humans do unreasonable things. But, but, but it frustrates me that there's an emotional connection that the Fountainhead in particular, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it just came up for me, the Fountainhead came up in conversation just th this last week where somebody who's an architect or urban planner was highly inspired by the fountainhead. And I'm like, yeah. So, so yes, yes, and yes, yes. Well, maybe, I, I don't know, you kind of chicken and egg it because I think if you want to ask the right questions, you have to have the right critical line of thinking. And so if you can identify the key points that one wants to make, then one can look personally for personal stories or the right kind of question for the other party or something like that. So it's, it's a little chicken and egg. I don't think it's one or the other, but I just wanted to make sure it was both. 
So, so I, th I think what you're saying is that you can lard a logical argument with personal stories and, and connective things. So there's a, a, there's a mixture possible of the two strategies, which I think makes lots of sense and is, is true. Um, Jean, Michael, any thoughts on, on any of this stuff? Or, or, or even like my framing of this? I think I've got more feelings. There you go. I think I have more feelings than thoughts about this one. Jeremy. Excellent. Um, I'm stuck with the personal belief that libertarianism is a world failure. It's um, uh, an emotional pathology. Th these guys are dead. Mm -hmm. They're wrapping themselves in uh, excuses that have the depth of Ayn Rand. Uh, to the extent that they're a club, they're a club of losers and incompetence at, at the social level. Um, a, a, a third of Silicon Valley is strongly libertarian. These people yeah. are not entirely dead. Um, no, 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 they're not. None, uh, yeah, the, the walking dead, the, the technical dead, if you like. Okay. But it, it's like the, the current analysis on how do you change people's minds seems to say you don't. Huh. Uh, so say more. They may change their minds, um, but it, it takes a bit of a bump to get them to trip over the truth, to quote one of the lines that uh, Jean pointed me to. Um, I've just been um, involved in a little argument with not a climate denier, because he won't deny it's climate, but he's denying that it's anthropomorphic. Mm -hmm. And just watching his head spin was fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. it, and after, you know, playing with it for a little bit, I mean, we were just juggling. You know, I gave up because what am I trying to do and why? And so that's, that's the question that's sitting for me at the moment. Jerry, you call a, a, a meeting, I'll join in if I've got time. And absolutely. But when I looked at the topic of this one, I thought, why bother? What, what, is the, what is the purpose that's available to us um, here? A strategy for turning a libertarian into a decent human being? Is there a thread, this is just popping in and I'm sorry to be interrupted, no, no, but, but it seems to me that most of, at my core, I'm an extreme independent. Um, and very centered in my personal value framework. And for the most part, the rest of the world can have their own personal value framework because that's part of mine is you're entitled to your own framework. Yeah. The tricky space is the community dimension of the extent to which we attempt to impose our framework on other people who have different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And when you institutionalize it, it gets even worse. Mm -hmm. So maybe the thread to explore is that boundary of personal freedom mm -hmm. with social responsibility in multiple dimensions. Because, how, yeah. go ahead. So how do we get on with libertarians rather than how do you change a libertarian? How well, do we I, find I, values? I, can we find values that we share from which we can do something constructive mm -hmm. for the whole? which evolved, eventually could evolve to a better sense of community. Maybe that's absolutely. too optimistic, but... No, no, I think it's the absolute requirement. I think we've got to do the, exactly that. My question is, why do you have to change a libertarian's mind to achieve it? Well, I came here because I had no clue what a libertarian was to begin with. So I read, this, so I read this paper, which sort of gave me a basic set of concepts that says this is what a libertarian thinks. I looked at the Wikipedia page first and I got lost in it because it segmented it into so many pieces that it was like me and my dog named Arrow in the Pointless Forest. Um, and I don't know, there, there are certain things that, that seem to make sense, but there are certain things that my experience says are inconsistent with history, mm -hmm. um, you know, 
there are no free. It's a free markets. Right? There are no free markets. I've never. I've never seen one. Um, they're a, they're a fiction of somebody's mind. Um, I mean, you 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 can't have a a free market when you know you have access to one electric company and uh, one water company, and you know, and and there are certain things that you can't you can't avoid. You can't do without. But there aren't alternatives. Um, and then the, the comment about limited government. Well, some people talk about big government and little government. How about the appropriate sized government that enables you to accomplish what you want to accomplish? And my experience is that, that people contort their beliefs about these labels so that they mean whatever they want them to mean. I mean, Republicans are not what Republicans used to be. Democrats are not what Democrats used to be. They've sort of changed their set of organizing beliefs over time just to be different. And, you know, the, the, for me, the appropriate question is, what is it we're trying to accomplish and what, what helps us get there? Um, and th thank you for taking us in these different directions, all of you, because you're reminding me of a bunch of stuff that I've thought of over time and I've been, I've been going to the places in my brain as we, as we. <laughs> so, uh, you know, everybody knows the saying, uh, Lord Acton saying power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. So here's absolute power corrupts, absolutely, which is from Lord Acton. <clears throat> but um, I actually borrowed that and I have a, um, I, I talk about how centralization corrupts and um, centralization is a form of exercise of power. So, so I, I don't think I'm that, that far afield from what, what was being said. But w one of the problems here is that libertarians, for example, um, are completely freaked out about Stalin and Mao, like freaked the hell out. And there's, um, so Murray, Murray Rothbard, uh, so here's Murray Rothbard and Gene, uh, Mises, Hayek, a bunch of those are basically the, the founders, uh, the, the, the other intellectual forefathers, along with Ayn Rand, uh, of uh, libertarianism. So there's a Mises Institute, Murray Rothbard was the, 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 the director of it. And he, he wrote, uh, 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 here we go, he wrote this note, <clears throat> Down with Primitivism, a thorough critique of Polanyi years ago, which was a critique of The Great Transformation, which is one of my favorite books. Um, and so he's critiquing Polanyi. And basically, if you read this, this letter, um, I'll post the, the link in our chat. If you read this letter, there, the, A, it's not thorough. Um, B, he's putting words in Polanyi's mouth that, that, that Polanyi is not saying, does not mean, does not intend. Polanyi is an economic historian who's using facts and data to try to say, hey, this is what happened when we destroyed the old ways we used to live together and converted it all to industrial economy. Um, He's not saying we should go back, you know, he's the, the Rousseau noble savage argument, which is the first thing that libertarians will bring up and others, other conservatives. He's not saying that whatsoever. Um, he's just saying, hey, we screwed up a bunch of pretty high functioning ways of working uh, in the middle of feudalism, which is a low functioning way of working. Uh, but this is, this is how it was. And so there's a, a whole bunch of, uh, here, which is about institutional design, public goods, um, the public, go you know, public goods dilemmas. What, what what should we fund together? How do we how do we manage the commons together? <clears throat> and one of the um, one of the really important uh, uh, parts of this to me is this whole notion of governing the commons and of realizing that we have commons. <clears throat> so uh, another another touchstone for me here is that we used to think about commons like we used to understand how to live in community on the commons. And I have a, a whole thread here on that, which is um, here it is. So we used to know how to live. Oops. Let me click properly on that so it goes to the middle. We used to know how to live in community on the commons. And if you go back to the Maori tradition, you, you have the word kaitiaki, which is stewardship or custodianship. You have uh, waka wanautagatanga, which is establishing relationships. If you go to the uh, Quechua and Aymara traditions, there are words for all these kinds of things. They, this was like baked into evolved societies back in the day, which we sort of stomped on. And we turned commons into natural resources, which is another thought I have. We basically stopped thinking about these as commons, just like we stopped thinking about humans as citizens and we turned them into consumers. We turned the, the, the commons into natural resources, which companies with their own privileges and rights and more rights than humans do, 
and no death penalty, we basically took them out and said, uh, you know, go crazy, take care of the earth. Um, so when you transform commons into resources, you basically dissolve them. And here I'm quoting uh, a piece commenting in the New Society by Gustavo Esteva, who I met years ago in Oaxaca, Mexico, because he ran the University of the Earth <clears throat> and studied under Ivan Illich, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So sorry for the long riff and the many different hyphae I'm sort of weaving through the brain here, but I'm trying to sort of activate and show you all the different parts of this, this, um, this thicket, uh, this ball of twine around these issues and seeing if we can't distill them or synthesize them a little bit. Because you, you see when I do purple thoughts, uh, purple thoughts are usually sort of distillations uh, and I call them out with, with I, I use yellow and purple to, to accentuate things in, in my brain, to draw my attention and others to these things and uh, uh, trying to figure that out. So I will, I will pause again. What's this distinction between purple and yellow, Jerry, in your coding system? It's a, it's a thready distinction. Yellow I tend to use for non-controversial things. <coughs> Excuse me. So types, uh, types of libertarianism was yellow, <coughs> articles about libertarianism. So when something gets crowded in my brain, I usually, first thing I do is I create a sub thought called articles about X. And I color that always yellow because I'm, I'm about to collect a whole bunch of stuff that's going to disappear from view um, at the top level. And it's important that other people go, oh, what's yellow? I'll go click on that. And, and once you know, the, once you know my, li my little tropes here about coloring things, you'll go to the colored things first when you see a, when you see a crowd. And so the yellow ones are usually non-controversial. The purple ones tend to be more my opinion or my insights about stuff. Um, uh, so I think, I think that's probably the, 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 the distinction. Okay, thank you. And uh, the, yeah, and the Cato <coughs> Institute is, is one, it's the major American think tank on libertarianism. Uh, Mises is, you know, the pretty more international, but there, there's a bunch of these and, and they've gotten very visible in the last 30 years as part of the conservative agenda to create think tanks to buttress conservative thought. So the Heritage Foundation, uh, American Enterprise Institute, a whole bunch of others basically come out of, um, they come out of Gold, Goldwater's loss uh, in the election of, I guess, 64. <clears throat> basically there was a crisis of conservatism when Goldwater lost. And everybody was like, oh my God, we're, mm -hmm. we're losing everything. We're not, we, we've got to change everything we're doing. And that was a real milestone in the conservative movement, as far as I can tell. This is all amateur histor history, so. Uh, but those things that I just said, I've also got in my brain, so I'll just might as well go there since we're having that kind of conversation. But if you, if that particular point right there, yep. we used to know how to live in community on the commons. Yes. Um, community is not what it used to be. Not at all. So that's with why a, say, with, that's with, why with an emphasis concerned. with an emphasis on live, so that as as community deteriorated, and the focus was not on live and became on money, the commons are just a resource to be mined, and the tragedy of the commons is a vicious thing because it says. If, if I don't take it, somebody else will. So in so, terms of, of managing the commons, there, there are only a couple of approaches to, to dealing with that structure. And one is the, the participants realize that if they don't manage the commons, they will lose it completely. And if they're not willing to do that and it is sufficiently important, some higher authority needs to manage them. Yes, and so Tragedy of the Commons, Garrett Hardin's 1968 paper is under uh, a thought I have here called Landmark Papers That Fucked Up the World. <laughs> um, and I only have two things here. I have Milton Friedman's uh, New York Times Magazine cover story from 1970, The Social Responsibility of Businesses to Increase Its Profits, which leads us to, directly to Reaganomics later and Thatcherism, and the Tragedy of the Commons. And I hate the tragedy of the commons. I think it's a, it, it, was, it was basically an uninformed rumination, which I don't mind, except this one, took, this one ate our brains. So when somebody says commons, instead of thinking, oh, all the important stuff that we share that we have to maintain or we all die, instead of thinking that, everybody thinks, oh no, tragedy of the commons, which immediately takes us to, 
well, commons are impossible to manage, so why bother? At, at least that's the logic I see happening over and over and over again. And so the problem here is we have to revive people's interest in the commons, which, which David Bollier and a whole bunch of people are doing a really good job of um, in, oops. Uh, let's go to commenting instead. There we go, living in the commons. And David Bollier in particular is sort of a, 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 a prime example of this, trying to help us understand <clears throat> um, what does it mean to live together in the commons again, right? And so I have a whole bunch of stuff under David. He's written a bunch of books and articles that are really good. Um, he is a, a defender of the commons. Uh, I don't know how many people I have here. I should probably put uh, Lynn Ostrom here. There we go. She was a defender of the commons because she was trying to help us figure out how to take care of commons. Uh, the, the diggers uh, were defenders of the commons. So back in uh, the levelers and the diggers, basically <clears throat> um, the levelers were called levelers during the English Civil War because they were going and leveling out uh, uh, fences and ditches that had been put in to wall off uh, land during the early enclosure movements. And so they were trying to level the land again to say, no, 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 we all live on the land and the land is for all of us to, 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 you know, to work together. Now, I will, I will point out that in an era of nomadic peoples and an era of moving around, uh, you could do this. And there's a whole train of thought about how Native Americans and Aborigines <clears throat> all uh, basically manage the landscape instead of any particular asset. Yeah, and, um, and it's really a question of who owns the playing field, isn't it? Uh, very much so, but also, um, but also about how do we see the playing field? And and one of the important things here for me is um, is that there are scripts running in our heads that we don't realize were put there through titanic battles <clears throat> that are going on to this day. So, for example, there are conservative scripts. Uh, here we go. How conservatives took over the agenda. Oh, no, I had to go to the, well, let me go to the other one. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so go ahead. Can I make an analogy here or metaphor? Yes, please. Um, in my advancing age, I have to do things to take care of myself and my partner and I are playing duplicate bridge once a week. Oh, good. Yeah. Very good. Lots of fun. Meet all sorts of people. Well, not all sorts of people, they're 98% old <laughs> and whatever. But their politicals are, these are people I would never, ever meet. Right. Conventional circumstances of my, my lifestyle, my politics, my direction, my whatever. Well, I mean, might, but we're in different packages. Fine when we're playing bridge. The rule set within which we play um, makes it possible for us to play. This is. Mm -hmm question that you can only compete inside cooperation. You cooperate on the rules within which you compete. Mm -hmm. well, we've had the enclosure of the commons, um, the leveling attempt. And really, if, if, if you've got a level space, then you can have a quasi free market, an open society, a network of co commonalities or whatever. If you don't have a living playing field, it's all talk. It's all, it's all those books. I mean, I'm I'm very impressed with David Bollier, but what what are we going to do? Write some more books and get the job done? The books aren't doing it. Well, no. people are actually out there doing commoning. I mean, there's a Absolutely. whole bunch of books, and they're totally supported <clears throat> by the books. But right. on a statistical level or an over overall game plan, all these energies seem to exist as resistances to a status quo, the P whole PTP foundation, you know, striving mightily to create commons everywhere. Of course they are, as was the cooperative movement. Is it an oxymoron when the two words neither of them work with each other? <laughs> so, um, you know, they, they're not actually doing anything except outlining the problem in more detail and accuracy and, and whatever, they're not solving it. Because so the problem I, is the playing field. Yeah, so I, I kind of disagree with that in the sense that 
<clears throat> I see them, A, drawing attention to things that work so that others might copy them. Agree. B, putting open source plans for everything out in the open so that everybody can pick <clears throat> them and do them and riff on them. Right. Um, C, participating in and structuring their own efforts in way that are ways that are commoning like, in meaning using cooperative structures, open source, a uh, whole bunch of other stuff like that. So, so I see them act, and, and, and maybe D, um, <clears throat> knitting together or bridging a lot of these movements that don't know how they're connected. So four out of four. All of which all four. But what's what, to me like more than. I'm sorry, Jerry, to be sort of, this is bad protocol for these things. Jamming the space, and I think I've jammed the whole thing. No, I, I last. And sorry, I lost a little bit of what you said. <laughs> I was apologizing. Jimmy, welcome to the call. <laughs> but it, it's, you know, I, I, I've been a, a dedicated thumper of the tub uh, for 30, 40 years. I, uh, you know, I've, I've followed the, the collective works of and I've read many of the books. My estimate is we're still losing. The, many of the books about what? Everything. Commonality, oh. politics, life, ecosystems, entropy, add it all together. Why are we still in this mess? And what's the score? And the score looks basically like, you know, Lions 85, Christian 0 at this point. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, I think these energies um, and um, prodigious literature are in some way a symptom of our failure, not our success. And it's, it's only when the playing field changes that we can get on with playing cards. I mean, I, I, I want a community where I don't care what the guy thinks. I don't care what he does. I care what his behavior is, his responsibility is, that's it. He can think unicorns and fairies. He can think magically in all directions. He can be a libertarian or a Maoist, provided we get along. So how do we get along is the absolutely baseline conversation for me, not, not why should we or all that. I'm sorry to be, so, I, I'm in a bad mood today. I'm so sorry, Michael. <clears throat> I hope you're getting into a better mood by working this out of your oh, system. Oh, yes, yes. This is feeling much better. I, I thought you were in a good mood, Michael. <laughs> well, we just started our, our, our you know, you've heard of B2B and P2P and all this. Uh, and we just launched the B2P process. It's uh, beer to the people. Beer to the people. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's our, um, our money is, is in circulation. A whole 500 bucks of it is out there to change the world. But it's, we, people are unified around things that bring them together. Not around discussions about which and what and where. It, it's, it's so often it's the man sitting around the coffee table discussing politics or whatever and uh, the real energy is going on in the background uh, this is another expression of that from my perspective mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me i've been very devilish today in the advocacy that's all right uh, speaking of speaking of which jamay how was tenure forecast and how uh I'll, I'll bring you a little up to speed on the conversation here in a sec but uh <laughs> How, how's, how's, how's the forecast? Uh, the forecast event went very well. Uh, my particular part of it was giving a 30 minute uh, talk on climate. And um, it, uh, I had several people tell me afterwards that they had started to cry by the end. So my job there was done. Um, <laughs> Were you by uh, any chance videotaped? I was, uh, and I believe that those videos will eventually be made public. Um, okay. The I can read you the in my concluding paragraph because this is the what. <clears throat> this is a remarkable point in history. Our past theories and practices have failed us. The futures that we that we imagined we'd have that we'd hope for 
have been washed away in front of us. We can see with greater clarity than ever before the interwoven consequences of our decisions, and we are now left with the most terrifying of opportunities. We have to create something new. And uh, so, you know, I was basically up there with a scary voice and all dressed in black and uh, doing my usual, the world, was, the world was ending, do something about it, you bastards, talk was, and- uh, so, so close to Valpurgisnacht. <laughs> so, um, but uh, the, the whole event went very well, it actually went better than I expected it to. And, uh, um, but this is more of, of a, um, a, a conversation for next week, I think, for, for the, uh, for the other, not not the IJB. Sorry, what what do you mean next week? Uh, sorry, the uh, your your usual monthly. I'm suddenly blanking. Uh, oh, uh, the Rex Rex call. Rex call. This gotcha. is more of a Rex, Rex thing than an IJB thing. I'm here to listen and learn. No worries. And and so let me take up because I saw you post um, that last paragraph to Facebook, mm -hmm. and and I had this reaction to it, which is. Um, I, I don't know that we need to invent something new. I think we need to synthesize the best of the old and the best of the new while dropping a lot of these scripts from, from our heads. And so uh, partly what I believe is that our, our brains have been eaten. It's a little bit like toxoplasmosis or uh, uh, parasite fungi. Cordyceps. Cordyceps, thank you very much. Uh, here we go, entomopathogenic fungi like uh, uh, cordyceps and, and others. It's a little bit like them. They, they take over the body of an ant or a wasp or a beetle, uh, which then remarkably, while still being eaten and, and being turned into food, still goes about doing its thing until as a last gesture, it goes up onto a leaf or a branch and bites down on it and then becomes a, basically a launch platform for more spores of the parasitic fungus. That is what the belief scripts have done to us. They've basically allowed us to convert our entire world from what it was before not that it was all golden and idyllic before, but it changed our minds about how we see each other, how we see the, the earth, resources, all the stuff we're talking about. Um, and so to me, the most productive thing we could do is share what works, figure out how to live together um, while dropping, while noticing and then removing from view as many of these dysfunctional scripts as possible. So one of the scripts is um, people won't work unless they're hungry, unless they're starving. That's a, basically a conservative meme, that, that unless the threat of starvation uh, faces people, they will not go do anything productive. I believe this is complete bullshit. And all the studies of basic income and, and uh, direct cash uh, pay subsidies and all that kind of stuff say th there's no correlation. There's a couple really good recent articles about this anyway. But it's a meme. And it's a fundamental meme. It's one of those things like time equals money uh, or scarcity equals value that's really hard to flush from the buffers. So to me, that's one of the big questions is how do we do that? Because <clears throat> if we can do that, we can then have very productive, very local conversations about how do we govern? What do we do? What are our models? Let's make it all work. So, so scarcity doesn't equal value? No. For some people? Uh, for me in general, no. So, so um, here's the meme, scarcity equals value, <clears throat> which is sort of a conservative capitalist point of view and, um, and it goes along with maximizing shareholder value and a bunch of other stuff. But basically that means you generate artificial scarcity. And um, what I'm interested in is business models and other sorts of things around abundance. There, that's entirely possible to, to have, uh, you know, profitable business around abundance like open source software, right? Yes, but for those people who are in certain businesses, scarcity is profitable. Uh, scarcity is, uh, <clears throat> so I went to business school and scarcity equal value is kind of a way of saying it's okay to go create artificial scarcity where there wasn't scarcity because that's the only way there's a viable business. Well, well I didn't say it was okay. I said they do it. That's because we've given them social license to do it. Okay. Because the playing field is tilted that way. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. And we, we, okay. We, so, so we you're not saying you're... like an okay thing because everybody knows that scarcity equals value. Okay, so you're not saying the statement is false. You're simply saying it's inappropriate. No, I'm saying um, scarcity can, in some cases, equal value. But as a general blanket statement that you hold all of reality up to, it's bad. It's very dysfunctional. Mm, yes, it's, it's bad and it's dysfunctional. Yet, yeah. 
in in the current construct, they get away with doing it all the time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, the, the financial people buying up aluminum and moving it around in warehouses, yep. so that it's not available to inflate the price. Yeah. Um, yes. Deflate the price. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, okay. So, so you just reminded me of a thought I put in my brain long ago, which is conventional wisdom that has been proven obsolete. These are means we should flush. So maximizing shareholder value, tragedy of the commons is here. Uh, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. The invisible hand, uh, that markets are the best way to allocate resources, nature, red and tooth and claw, all those kinds of things. And we had a there was a Rex call, I think, uh, long ago in 2015 called What Are Your Scripts, where we covered some of these sorts of things. Uh, and this is all under scripts we have running in our minds. Now, are you consider them obsolete or simply in or insufficient? Uh, not Cause... insufficient. I think they're damaging. I think they're, they're, I think they're not insufficient. I think they're actually wrongheaded. Um, and so, so the tragedy, yes, there are tragedies of commons. That's how a lot of civilizations have died. But the idea that commons are unmanageable because they always degenerate into tragedy is the, is the meme this carries. And that's very dysfunctional because what we need to do urgently is figure out how to manage our commons again. We need to Which identify we, them, learn to respect them again, and learn to manage them. And if, and if we don't, that will become a tragedy. Correct. If, you, if we don't, we basically follow the, the path of other civilizational uh, you know, agl agglomerations that kill themselves off, which is what we're busy doing, what we're doing now at a global scale, instead of at Easter Island when we farm away all the trees and suddenly there's no trees and then there's no crops and then yeah, we but don't. Who, who's we, white man? I mean, let's get back to the, the, the sort of, <laughs> the, the, the issue here is colonialism. Yes, right. Societies yeah. killed themselves off by overgrazing by whatever they they were into. What was their gig, and they pushed it, and they overwhelmed the resources, and they blew out. On localized level, not as a planet, not as an entire species, um, and, and <clears throat> even in those communities, there was substantial periods of comparative stability because you had to get along with each other. To the point, it wasn't you know perfect Austrian. <laughs> And all that stuff, but it was like you got along with your neighbor because he was bigger than you, or, or whatever. And now we're in a different place. The place we're in is the place where the game is rip and run. We are driven by a monetary incentive system which is pretty inescapable. Uh, whether we think of it about it or not, and I agree that we do think about it, and we have these tropes and memes in our minds which are pretty simple. Eat or be eaten, me first and screw you. Um, th th those are the, the axiomatic drivers of our world. Until we change that, we're going down. Until there's another way to do this stuff, we've had it. Next. <laughs> well, my, my hero, Ricardo Semler, said, the kindergarten is a good place to start. But don't stay there. <clears throat> right, to start uh, teaching people. And, and unfortunately, <clears throat> unfortunately, this is a, this is, um, been learned by, by authoritarian dictators and all that as well. So, <clears throat> you know, you get the, you get the Nazi youth uh, and, and, and all of that, because if, if I can get you when you're seven years old, I can mold you for life kind of thing. Well, okay, so, so the, you know, and then, the nature of scientific revolutions by whoever it was, I forget. Thomas. Um, and, you know, he said that, that, you know, the the way that you change is to teach the, the new paradigm to the next generation. The difficulty of, in doing that is it's the existing people under the current paradigm that are doing the teaching. Yes. Um, and if we have a centralized education system, this, this, this comes back to one of the many issues that are sort of eddying around our, our topic here. <clears throat> if, we, if we overly centralize the education system, we create bottlenecks where you can control that, who's teaching and what, what they get to teach. And here I have, I have a whole riff on the Texas School Board um, and, and basically their dysfunction. Uh, oops, got to spell it right. Uh, ba -da -ba -da. 
and basically conservatives figured out that that was true. And so conservatives basically uh, took over uh, the Texas school board, and, which dictates what texts can be brought into, you know, half of the schools in the country, public schools. So over centralization of education then creates exactly the kinds of dysfunctions that we're talking about, which is one reason to have less centralization and more unschooling or deschooling. Well, um, I'm, I, I've been at school many times, um, and I, the best thing I got out of it was even- There we go. <clears throat> this is what I, the thought I'm looking for. The market economy requires a market society. Yeah. Go ahead. That, well, that, thank you. Michael, That's, what was the best thing you got out of school? Uh, even Illich, de-schooling society. <clears throat> The school is, by nature, going to argue for schools. I mean, Thomas Kuhn saying, let's educate him. He was already a product of about 40 years of institutional education by the time he voiced that thought. <laughs> so uh, I, much as I approve of the generality of the direction, I just don't believe it. We've been trying education for an awful long time. It works just about as good as religion. It doesn't. You know? <laughs> so um, so I'm, I'm, I'm basically saying in my perspective as far as i can see the money is a real problem and we're screwed how about we have our own money who, who would like their own money as a koan who would like their own money <clears throat> and i'm torn on that because own yeah, money <laughs> that is, stay torn stay torn right. there. Don't, exactly. don't answer the koan please yeah. that's for the brain and just just bear in mind that it's a question that can be asked of everybody on the planet and every corporation and every municipality. Wouldn't you like your own money? And the <coughs> response is almost invariably, yeah, yeah, but, but, yeah, but. But I'm focusing on the yeah side of it because until people are drawn by their, by what draws them, mm -hmm. They ain't going anywhere. So, and we've just, just found, found out a how question, to... Michael, in terms yeah. of my money, because if I have my money, what use is it to me? Because no one else wants my money. Ah. That, yeah, that's the, um, what's his name? Hyman Minsky line. Anybody can create money. The hard part is getting other people to take it. Mm -hmm. Right. So the real point of your money is not what you get. It's what you give. It's about service in network. It's, um, it's uh, putting the egg before the chicken. Uh, we, we tend to look at money as the entitlement to have, to get. How much money did you get for that? What are you going to get for your money? You know, it's, it's a getting thing. It pulls us towards well, the, you know, the, the I idea. totally agree that it's the giving or how one uses their money. No, 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 no. You're, you're, you're up a stage yet. Okay. What, the, what action results in there being money? And in, in the, 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 oh, irony okay. with, the irony with your money is you can't actually have your money. You can give other people your money. You, other people have your money. What you've got is obligation. If you've got any of this local soft stuff, you've got other people's promises. You're, you're not engaged as a promisor if you're in the credit side of that economy. It's only if you're on the negative side, if you're one of the issuers. So by issuing promise, we give promise to others in the credit side of the economy. So what, what happens is that this sort of money enables me to be a carpenter, to be a baker, to be a consultant, to be a designer, to be a whatever, and be acknowledged for it. So it's the act and then because we're in a circulatory feedback community, a, 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 bio, a biomimicking condition, we will get the results of our product in that context. If people like it, we'll get credit. If people don't like it, we'll get pissed off. So it's, it's like you act and the money results rather than 
show me the money, what can I be guaranteed for it? Because that's back to the atomistic, the homo economist, the, all that stuff. Whereas when it's, you do something, and because of the nature of the systemic relationship between the players, i.e. what song are we singing around here? Are we in the tune of C major or is this key or something else, you know? What point of the spectrum is this conversation taking place on? Okay. But it's all about individuals acting and seeing the consequences from their community's response to them. That's the difference. And when I, when I talk about having your own money, I mean participating in those sort of networks, which I, I, I never argue as a contradiction of or an opposite to, an alternative to. I, I present it as, you're doing all that, why don't you do this too? What's to lose? Who's on first? Is it still working? Well, that's what I said. Beer to the people. Uh, We're showing these guys. You can go into this pub, and there's a jar on the counter, and we'll have a photograph of it in a couple of days. And it's got this money in it, and it says, support the fire rescue fund. We at the pub want to support the fire rescue fund. If you put cash in this jar and take out the coupon, the cash goes to the fire rescue fund, the coupon, come over here and it buys you half your beer. It's 50% coupon on the beer. So of course the uptake is, is quite predictably high. There's a benefit to the customer. There's a benefit to the fire rescue fund. The question is, how long does it take the business to, gen to recognize the benefit of having its own money in persistent circulation in addition to their usual stuff, which is the conventional fiat money, which is here and gone, here and gone, here and gone, here and gone. Here they've got money that's here and here and here and here. So it's a bit like the marshmallow test for the two-year-old. If the business can keep its fingers out of the cash pot for a couple of weeks, the business gets money forever. God, I'm ranting today. It's practice. I've got to start speaking again. This is, James, you remember this stuff from way back, I expect. I bombed from a great height at an IFTF in, what, I think 2007 or something. Well, J Jerry, you got me in there, didn't you? <clears throat> yeah, that was, um, I don't know what year that was, but, uh, but yes. Long time ago. <clears throat> Long, on a planet far, far away, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So let me let me pause for a second because we've been at this kind of an hour, and take us gently back to the question I was posing at the beginning and see if we can't synthesize a couple things out of where we are, because I think we've we've, um, we've, we've touched a whole bunch of things, um, and I'm I'm really interested in creating a handy package to hand somebody that would let them cruise through a bunch of ideas and ponder, you know, ponder the implications of their belief system, is I guess what I'm saying. Uh, is that practical, doable? Uh, what, how, how could I make it better brain? <clears throat> their their yeah, belief system is around the what? Of the brain. Uh, in this case, libertarianism, but it could be anything. It could be creationism, it could be... Uh, Judaism, uh, Roman Catholicism, you know, kind of pick your ism, it could be anything, uh, or it could be some, you know, specific thing like the tragedy of the commons. That's, uh, you know, I feel like I, I've got a lot of stuff in the brain that debunks the tragedy of the commons and that tries to frame it, but I'm really interested in making it more powerful, more visible, more palpable, more useful. I'm, I'm okay. So what do you mean by debunk the tragedy of the commons? Um, we we yeah. talked about it a few moments ago, and, and I thought you agreed that left to its own devices, without the people engaged, smartening up, it will become a tragedy. Uh, it takes cooperation. <clears throat> it takes a sort of wisdom and cooperation to manage commons well. Okay. So, yes. Um, so, yes, what? Even to realize them at some point. 
You know, um, I put a link into an oatmeal comic mm -hmm. in the chat, um, which deals very expressly with the difficulty of getting somebody to change their mind in any way. <laughs> Um, and basically, it, it's you know a nice two or three minutes. It's nicely done, but it comes out with suffer the interaction, the the maligda, malig amygdala. Ma you got it. Easy for you to say. Rules. You know, like when people are spun, they're spun, and um, basically expect emotional outrage, resistance, and paradigm block at everything you offer somebody that they don't already know. Take it or leave it. And I, you know, I, I'm trying to pour fresh oil on these waters and <laughs> reignite them in a way. I don't think there's a way to change people's minds with ideas. I think they change with action. Mm -hmm. well, well, okay, and the, the action produces a result that, that gets them to think okay. about something differently. Well, well, to the results it, of the I action. I don't care what people think about. I care what they do. And I, I recognize that thinking can often help and augment that. But functionally, we don't think about balance when we ride a bicycle. We balance. But we, but we learn balance through experience, and therefore we don't have to think about it anymore. So to, to, to the idea is going to do it for us. But bef in other words, before they could not think about it, they had to think about it. I, I, I still remember when I learned to drive a car. And I'm driving down the road, both hands on the wheel, focused intently on everything in front of me. Because I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And now I drive from here to wherever, listening to the radio, talking to my wife, and thinking about something else. And I don't even remember the trip. All right? So it's the way that we learn to manage complexity by sort of um, ingraining it into our being, though there's a belief there that has developed over time through that experience. And, and if I am going to change my behavior, the belief has to change. And that's what I kind of what I mean by the scripts in our heads. <clears throat> Those are the belief systems that are all linked together. And and for most of them, we have we have integrated them into our being to such an extent that we don't know what we believe until something sort of pings it. And, all right. And and here the bicycle, learning to ride a bicycle is a really, really, really interesting example because <clears throat> when you learn to drive a car. You go to driver's ed, you learn traffic rules, you learn like the pedals and all that. I could sit down and try to explain to you how gyroscopically a bicycle is staying up and it would mean nothing to you and it wouldn't help you ride the bike. Correct. And, and, and when somebody's trying to help you ride the bike, they can kind of say steer this way. It doesn't actually even help that much. The act of moving it and, and, and like mastering control is, is a physical thing that incorporates riding a bike into your body in, in, in some way. But, but yeah, there's the almost time, no explanation to it. The only <laughs> time I ever saw Doug Engelbert was at a conference in San Francisco in, I think, 2004, where he described teaching his children to ride a bicycle by sitting them on the bike, full standard bike, no training wheels, no crap. <clears throat> Move the handlebars. He would, he would say, I will hold you up as long as you keep the handlebars moving. We will move forward when you say forward, and we will stop when you say stop, and I will hold you up. And if they stop moving the handlebars, if they stop the to and fro, he stopped moving. Done. Two or three minutes, they're riding a bike. Riding a bike. They're, they're, they've incorporated the sway and the swerve into their experience. It's done. That's how they do it. Um, there's a little um, dog park where I take my mom often to go walk around, and there's kids riding little bicycles around the park. And half the kids, uh, the little kids, have training wheels, and I curse them every time, but just under my breath. And half the kids are on little slider, scooter, whatever you call them, basically bikes with no pedal, uh, which is how you should learn to ride a bicycle, because you know the, you're going to learn the balance on that one, and then you can just add the the, the, the power to it. Um, but but the training wheels are what we're doing, sort of 
with the wrong scripts in our heads in yeah. the rest of society. Yeah. And, and Michael, I think what you're trying to do is you're trying to give us a bicycle for a different kind of money. And money is buried in the limbic system in ways that Gene is trying to describe, I think. So, so our, our attitudes, our approaches, our hoarding and husbanding of money are, Absolutely. are the fact, and one of the thoughts in my brain is like, we, we suddenly after the industrial revolution, this is one of the things that Polanyi says, suddenly everything, almost everything had a price. Well, and, and yeah, before yeah. the Industrial Revolution, everything did not have a price. There, there were no prices on things. Yeah, it's like a, a universal solvent. Yeah. Um, substantial money became the universal solvent. That's why I call it colonialization. Um, it's the, and Michael Hudson calls it the parasite that took over the world. You know? Right. Um, I also think that it's deeply related to the difference between in and out. It's a boundary consideration. Say more? We, well, normally conventional money is outside us. It is a bill or a coin or a bearer bond or something that exists as a thing of value. And now it is in my possession, but when I spend it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. it's a thing outside me. And that buys very strongly into me as the egocentric collector of properties. You know, what have I got? How much have I got? What happens to it when it when I let you know the, the giving and getting becomes about crossing the interface between my wealth space and the alien space out there, the in to the out. And conventional money is, uh, I feel, almost a universal solvent. It reduces everything to the same value equation, which is me against you. Mm -hmm. It's not just five restaurants in town competing against each other. The restaurants are competing against the, the, the shops. They're competing against the Amazon. Amazon is competing. We're all competing. Amazon has super imposed that um, one currency to measure them all problem that we got into so many years ago. And I, I think the, the issue is variety. There must be complex self-managing systems that are the expression of the behavior and attitudes and beliefs and actions of the, those involved. Mm -hmm. And I, that, that, that I agree with wholeheartedly. Um, how, does, <coughs> how does your thinking about money map to the older thinking of the metacurrency crew? Basically, um, Arthur Brock and uh, Jean-Michel... It's not that old. That's new thinking. This is all. Uh, they've, they've been on this project for 25 years, Michael. Uh, well, Arthur 20, in about 20 years ago, Jean-Francois a little later than that. Um, and Meta Currency and Scepter are products of about 2008, 2010. Um, Scepter was a new branch off before they did Holochain. Yes, but the Meta Currency right. stuff goes, goes really far back. Well, <laughs> It emerged from, um, from the late 2000s. And this was out of a conference in Bard, New York in 2004, where I was with uh -huh. Brock and Eric Harris Braun. Eric cool. worked with me for a couple of years, then Eric and Harris and uh, created the Meta Currency. So when I say it's, it's new, I mean in, in that sort of chronology. Okay. And um, it's, it's very good because they're defining how you define the act of in interaction and expectation. Right. The, the semantics of their uh, cyber currency stuff is terrific. I wish they would do it. And that's been the big distinction I've had with that field for the last 15, 20 years is, uh, I think there's poverty on the street, there's poverty in the villages, there's poverty all over the damn world. And I think it can be solved very quickly if we just act intelligently and sensibly. <laughs> Who am I to say that? <laughs> you see? So, so you, can, you can see the dilemma. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gene can see the dilemma. Um, yeah, I, I think money is the measure. It's, it's, a, it's a symbol system. It's a human artifact. It's a technology. And we have locked ourselves into one technology, which is the technology of the big club. Money as power, money as, as a form of enclosure. And we've used it to basically to wipe out indigenous communities worldwide and biological communities worldwide. Right. 
um, and we're going to carry on until we're dead. So, so pov poverty is one of those words that really frustrates me because um, in, again, the Greek transformation, he ta uh, Pauline talks about how poverty is a new word in the 1650s <laughs> uh, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution because not everything had a price, you didn't have to buy everything, and all of us in the village might die because of a plague, a famine, or Huns on, the, on yon hill over there, and you kind of look toward where the castle is, and it's like, I and my family are not going to make it into the castle walls, <clears throat> so we might all die. But the idea that one family in the village is going to go under because they don't have a job is nonsense. They like that. Absolutely. Unheard of, not a thing anybody yeah. understands. Yeah. Unemployment is a new term around 1750 because then employment becomes a thing. <laughs> um, but one of the uh, sustainable development goals is basically making sure that every, nobody, nobody is in poverty. I would love there to be a, a framing of this so that people wouldn't have to be earning any kind of currency, but would be fat and happy. Yes, universal right? basic economy. Uh, something like that, yeah. Yeah, I think that's perfectly available. And it's by counterpoint pointing the conventional money with the mm. commons money, the community money. Right. Uh, it's because that is the expression of people's contribution and interaction in that community of behavior. Uh, whereas the other stuff is the denial of all that. So have you looked at Marina's Universal Basic Assets? Don't know that one. No. Nope. And I don't. I haven't read it, so <clears throat> so I don't really know. Uh, but well, she's I, work, she's working some of these angles as well. I, I'm I'm a little suspicious of assets. That's the snapshot. It's the time slice. Um, flow is the thing that creates the assets. So the flow mm -hmm. patterns are much more interesting to me. Uh, I look for verbs, not nouns, and I think the, the asset concept is back in the noun space. And it's you... acquisitive and, uh, um, you know, retentive, pretty anal stuff. Did you ever hear of, uh, did you ever hear of uh, David Bohm's Rio mode? Ah, uh, no. Mm -hmm. no, no, no. So in his book, Wholeness in the Implicate Order, he invents a hypothetical language called Rio mode. Rio is flow, like a Rio stat, right? <laughs> And oh, so nice. it, it's basically a verb-centered language because his critique is that we are in a noun-centered world and our language reflects that. We have subject, verb, object, yeah. right? So he tries to invent just a hypothetical language uh, called real mode, which I know not that much more about. And there isn't that very much about it on the web, but, uh, but I've got it under hypothetical languages next to uh, mesangel, sol resol, vendor good, mm. uh, ro, e prime, well, there's an, an analogy here to um, how REA accounting, you know, McCarthy's REA accounting? Yes. Resources, events, agents, um, is focused actually on the verb. Hmm. Because unless there is an event, well, unless there's an event, what the hell, right? So mm -hmm. the economy in REA terms is the activity on the edges between nodes. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's all edge based. Conventional accounting, um, you know, corporate accounting, tax accounting, economic accounting, GDP accounting is entity based, not about flow. Mm -hmm. it, it may say there's this accumulation of aggregate flows, but it says nothing about patterns. And it's focused entirely on where do we end up? Who's got what? It's the mm -hmm. balance sheet world. So REA and real sound entirely compatible. Pity David Baum isn't around anymore. He'd probably mm -hmm. be able to make that, that all tie together somehow. Mm -hmm. I think we're moving to verbs. Nouns, nouns are passé. And we've moved considerably far from libertarianism and all that. And we're getting close to the end of our call mm -hmm. time. Um, so I wanted to just bring that back to the center of the table and see what thoughts anybody has as we wrap this call. Uh, kind of toward pointing back toward uh, the topic of libertarian belief systems, uh, how to have an interesting conversation, both logically and emotionally, about uh, the implications thereof. Uh, and, and I'll point out that, you know, the neoliberal agenda and a bunch of other things and half of Silicon Valley are deeply influenced by the libertarian belief systems. And I run into, you know, more than a handful of people in my life regularly who are very deeply convinced that, that you know libertarianism is the way to go and we're motivated by Ayn Rand and Fountainhead or whatever way back when um, 
uh, and, and my experiences in trying to plumb into it were really frustrating. So at the same time that I read The Great Transformation, which is clearly a book that has influenced me a lot, I also read Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, where Polanyi is an economic historian and he's got facts and tables and he says, here's what happened, here's what the data were, no, no, no. Hayek is scared shitless that the New Deal is going to turn America into Stalinist Russia. That is, he is, he is shitting his pants on paper that that is going to happen. And he makes all these assumptions and he throws away everything else. And it's insane. And I'm like, how does anybody like this guy? Like, like you can smell the fear in, uh, on the paper. And, and the same thing with Rothbard's letter about don't pay attention to Polanyi. Well, that's all how we fight a battle over ideas, yeah. right? And right now, the impeachment process is going on. Uh, yesterday, a highly decorated uh, soldier basically <laughs> testified that Trump, uh, in fact, did say Burisma and whatever during the call. And the far right's answer to this is, he was born overseas. He's a traitor or a secret agent. He's clearly not a patriot. And it's like, seriously, people? But, but, but really what you have to think of at that point is like, oh, apparently this is the best you've got because apparently the actual arguments about the case, you were unable to refute on any basis whatsoever because the attempts to hide all these things and bury them are failing. Um, and so it looks like impeachment's you know, imminent and hopefully pretty swift and then who knows what happens. But, but, we're, fa <laughs> but we're, facing, we're facing these conversations right this minute in the public sphere, which is why this topic has a lot of energy for me is that, is that a lot of what we do and say every day is based on these belief systems we have. And I'm trying to hack away at them to figure out how do we take the best of the old and the best of the new, including the best of libertarian thinking, and fuse it into something useful, purposeful, and very fractal, very decentralized. Michael, in the way you're talking about money, um, I'm talking about sort of belief systems, not that I want there to be like, like little pockets of places where people believe in, you know, Marquis de Sade as a belief system, but rather, how do we create lots of conversations so that this can settle into different places and, and have the sense of locality that, that, and specificity and personhood of place that makes it take root and actually be deeply grounded? Maybe I say too much there, but any, any sort of closing thoughts from, from any yeah, of Yeah, my, my closing thought is that we should have this conversation in a week after I go figure out what libertarianism is. Awesome. I love that. So I can put this uh -huh. back on the schedule. How about that? Lovely. Lovely. That sounds great. Because I, you know, I have never really spent any time figuring out what the Republicans and the Democrats and the Libertarians and all, all the rest of them actually believe, because I think they're all full of shit anyway. So, um, so you've had like a deflection filter up uh, to just avoid those, avoid diving into it. Well, the, you know, when they, when they, Actually, when somebody espouses a, a particular perspective, often I spend some time saying, does that make any sense? Right. And most of them don't. It is a problem. Mm. Mm -hmm. it is a well, problem. you know, and, the, and, and the, so the major part of the difficulty, I think, is, is people's unwillingness to actually um, do any critical analysis or critical thinking about what people are telling them. You know, they just, well, that sounds good. So as you explore libertarianism for a further conversation, I would be equally interested in what are the most high functioning belief systems you've run into? Which are the ones you like? What are the ones that, that smell right, that have some sense of, oh, okay, if we all lived kind of this way, that might actually be a good thing. So maybe we make that part of the conversation as well. Okay. okay. Uh, Judy, Judy, any thoughts? I just wish there were, this is not cogent, but I wish that somehow there could be a groundswell of connectivity and social responsibility that would sort of eliminate the need for all of this didactic argument. Yeah, I, I, I'm seeing that happening now all over the place in, in, in big ways. Um, one of the thoughts in my brain that I'll share just as, as on our way out here is, um, here we go, uh, 2020 tipping. Uh, basically, uh, I have a thought called, does 2020 mark a generational tipping point? And I 
point here to Jacinda Ardern, who is yes. the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Greta Thunberg, uh, uh, yeah. the Green New Deal, uh, Generation Z's, uh, AOC and the Squad, uh, the, basically the, the Parkland Kids, the Sunrise Movement, uh, all these kinds of things, to me, might in fact be a large catalytic yes. society global scale transformation. If they all kind of link arms and manage to, to coordinate without coordinate without centralizing, right? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I, I'm gonna make an IJB call about this topic too. Um, I think that would be really productive because I do see a level of um, a renewal of social activism in a somewhat constructive framework, more constructive than it has sometimes represented. Yeah. And it gives me quiet hope that humanity does have a collective self-preservation instinct and that there's wisdom that that instinct has to be around moving toward the good instead of criticizing the bad. And, and so I, I think that humanity does have that general instinct. My fear is that when a pacifist tribe that understands what it's doing with the earth and with one another meets a tribe that has guns, germs, and steel, the winner tends to be the violent one. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing right now that when the host gets taken over by a, a virus that's, I think, clearly malignant in many ways and clever in other ways, um, but is serving some people in, 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 in the host, that is really hard to remove. Like, like, you know, people have been trying really hard to figure out how to, how to get Trump out of the presidency and he's still president last I checked. Um, so uh, sort of from your lips to God's ears, right? Like, uh, yes, I'd, I'd like much more of that, but how, to me, the question, how? Your, your son died at- You just froze, just Jerry. Oh, sorry. Am I back? Yeah, the question. Yeah. Am I back? Yes. The voice is back. Oh God, I'm still, I'm still shaky here. All right, I've got there too many is. tabs gotcha. open and too much, too much going on, sorry. Uh, how, how can groups of people that understand what they're doing survive assault from very small groups that are highly focused who've decided they have nothing to lose? Who've decided that the path to victory is basically destructive. And that, that's what we, we're witnessing that right now. ISIS? Uh, no, no, the, the all right. Oh, that, oh, that. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Forget ISIS. <laughs> ISIS is localized. ISIS is not in you know uh, uh, Alabama and Idaho and Oregon. ISIS is way over on some other part of the world. The alt right <laughs> is everywhere and is busy uh, pursuing a scorched earth strategy to try to figure out how to run the table, you know, politically. So, so did you read Democracy and Change by McLean? Uh, no. Um, go to YouTube and look up Nancy McLean Democracy and watch some of her videos. <clears throat> it's a very thought-provoking piece of work about how the, the underlying current that's been in progress for the last 25 or 30 years to do just what you're saying. The Trump, Trump is a distraction. Okay. Yeah, um, can I summarize my, my perspective on tonight? Uh, sure. Before, uh, before I got, I got to run. Um, stop making sense, or stop <laughs> trying to make sense. This sense making has to be different from the way we're making sense at the moment. I'm not going to invite anybody to stop thinking. Everybody's going to keep thinking and reading, and I believe we should keep thinking and reading. I don't think, however, we should expect it to change much. I think what has to change is something to do with catching the thinking and turning it on itself, the koan. Mm -hmm. And the koan I'm uh, working up is, do you want your own money? Mm -hmm. uh, which I think is applicable at every level and person in the society with very common consequences. Um, I mean, in terms of, we seem to have the similar responses to it but also that it requires when there's any evaluation of it, that what we do is common, is in common. The common money is what it's about. And that that's now here and available. You know, plug in, kick it off, let's go. So it's, it's 
it's sort of it's it's a bike thing. It's the Engelbar move the handlebars and let's get this in in process. Um, love all the technical references to the uh, thinking that's gone on in the books that have been written, but time to get on a bike. Everybody get on the bike. All right. Um, and Gina did have Nancy McLean in my brain and a bunch of comments about her book, which I'll go back and look at again. It looks like a great book. Well, just go out. So a couple of our videos start. Uh, when I go to YouTube, you know, there's another <laughs> book somebody told me to read and when would I ever find time? So I go, go to YouTube and I find, I look up Nancy McLean Democracy and I find a whole list of videos That's that awesome. range anywhere from a minute and a half to like an hour and a half. Yep. So I start with the shortest ones and listen to two or three of those at 1.25 or 1.5. And, and if it seems no, somewhat noteworthy for some reason, then... I begin to pursue some of the longer ones because, you know, I have about as much time as you have. <laughs> uh, and and um, it, it seems to serve me well because I can't remember the last time I ever read a book. Though I would like to schedule a future session about the future of society because I have read, well, I have followed the works of five authors mm -hmm. that seem to have a consistent thread amongst them. And, and I'm developing a model of what it is that they're telling. Cool. Great That's awesome. idea. That's uh, awesome. But I also, I would say, could, we, could you post the topic for a meeting and give us a week to figure out what we want to bring to the table? You bet. <laughs> Helps with notice? the calendar last minute availability. Too. I know. Sorry. I was just like, come, this was sort of a come as you are call because I haven't had a no, I, I get it totally. Um, I was going to ask also, because I'm aware of Rex, but I haven't really actively participated there. Is there an easy way to commingle the availability of the conversation? Um, um, so I post all the Rex calls on YouTube. Rex is kind of a membership thing that whose membership I've, I've kind of uh, screwed up over time. So, okay. uh, so the, uh, the calls are all available um, uh, on YouTube, but, but uh, getting in, into that conversation is a little, a little bit funky. So, okay. Yeah. I remember that being an element of the site and I didn't have a business basis for getting in at the time that it was going on. So that makes sense. Thanks, Jerry. Cool. Um, thank you all. This has been like, uh, peaking, intriguing, and uh, and Gene, you have one more thing to say. Why aren't there more people here? I don't know. Oh, well, partly because I gave like 24 hours notice. I don't think that helped. I, um, I have another comment, though, relative to the Rex, because I think there's a lot of it that's relevant to the IJB stuff. Yeah. And so I could perhaps encourage people, I'll do some YouTubing and so forth, but um, perhaps watch for topics that would be suitable to bring into this group as well or merge in some fashion. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, thank you very, very much for lending your neurons to the cause. Take care all. Take care. Bye. Bye. Lovely. Bye, guys. Bye for now. Have a great day. Thank you.